welcome you this morning to St. James Presbyterian Church, and we are very glad that you are here. Please take note of the announcements that we have in our bulletin, and in addition to that, I know that we have more here, so if you would please come forward. Great to see you again, by the way. Thank you. Good morning. This afternoon is the Advent Festival. The spaghetti sauce is already warming up on the stove. It's going to be fabulous. The gingerbread houses are ready. The only thing is our pile of greens outside the kitchen door is still very tiny. So if any of you have a few minutes to go and prune a few shrubs and when you come bring uh, some of those greens so that we have enough to make our wreaths with. Don't forget your forms, your wreath forms, your, your um, wire cutters, your pruning shears. It's going to be a wonderful afternoon of making wreaths, singing carols, spaghetti dinner, gingerbread houses. Hope to see you there. Thank you. In addition to that, please do find the friendship pads, which are located in the center of each aisle. Take the time to sign them and pass them to those seated near you. And at the end of our service today, please do take the time to greet your brothers and sisters in Christ. Good morning. Just a couple notes about musical changes to our worship service today. First of all, if you have your little black songbook, I would encourage you to soon open to number 2090. And instead of the choir doing the introit, all of us will be singing the first verse of this song. This is our Advent candle song. We will sing a different verse every week in Advent. So in just a few moments, we will be singing the first verse of that song. And also, in the spirit of Advent, when we sing our response to the assurance of forgiveness, which is usually a glory to God in the highest, something along those lines. In Advent, we are going to sing the refrain from the familiar Christmas hymn, Angels We Have Heard on High. You probably do not need to look in the hymnal, but if you do, it's number 23, and we're simply singing the Gloria from Angels We Have Heard on High as our response during Advent. In addition to that, you notice the handouts in your bulletin. If you'd like to purchase a poinsettia for the Christmas season, we invite you to do that. And in addition, we have other notes on the uh, second handout, not only about the Advent Festival, which was already mentioned, but also about a Christmas concert and our two Christmas Eve services. So we hope to see you often during this wonderful and joyous season. At this time, let us prepare our hearts and open our minds for a time of morning worship. Let us worship God. Advent means coming. We are preparing for the full coming of God's kingdom. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. Please rise and join me in the responsive call to worship. We gather in preparation for good news is about to be proclaimed. We gather in expectation for the joy which is to come. We gather in celebration, for we are those people who have said yes to the manger, yes to love and flesh, yes to the one incarnate for others, yes to the wholeness of God. With preparation and expectation, let us celebrate. The hymn of praise is number two in the blue hymnal.
please be seated. We know that nothing is able to separate us from the love of God and Jesus Christ. Let us in freedom confess the wrong we have done. Let us pray. Merciful God, always with us, always coming. We confess that we do not know how to prepare for your advent. We have forgotten how to hope in miracles. We have ignored the promise of your kingdom. We get distracted by all the busyness of the season. Forgive us, God. Grant us the simple wonder of the shepherds, the intelligent courage of the magi, and the patient faith of Mary and Joseph, that we may journey with them to Bethlehem and find the good news of a child born for us. Now, in the quiet of our hearts, we ask you to make us ready for his coming. Amen. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Your sins are pardoned. The penalty is paid. Thanks be to God. be seated and at this time I'd like to invite any children who are worshiping with us to come forward for the children's message and together as a congregation let us sing. It's great to see you both here on this beautiful and crisp morning as we come together to celebrate Advent, which means coming. And we're specifically thinking about the coming of the Lord, aren't we? We're, we're thinking about Christmas Day, which is soon to be here, less than a month away now. And you've probably noticed as you entered the church today, there was a nativity scene out near the front on a table and you can see another nativity scene over here. And I actually like those nativity scenes a lot better because they have all of the characters on them. And this one here looks kind of, kind of empty. Something missing from this one. I see, well, you tell me. You tell me what you see. You see a camel. And you see the cow there, Liam. Yes, you see the cow, and there's a star, and there's a little stable here, and inside there's a place maybe where uh, Jesus could possibly lay, right, in that little spot there, but he's not there yet. We're still waiting, and we're waiting on this great promise, this great promise that has the potential really to change the world. It's an amazing gift that God has given us. Let us bow our heads and offer a word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear God, we come to you and we wait. We don't like waiting. Waiting makes us anxious. It makes us nervous. It makes us fidgety. We're ready to to get presents, to give presents, to see our families smile on Christmas Day. Help us to be patient. Help us to remember why we're waiting. Help us to remember that gift which you are giving to us. Jesus Christ, 
the light of the world. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming forward. You may go to your class now. What can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. Yet what I can, I give him, give him my heart. With gladness, let us present the offerings of our life and labor to the Lord. Will the ushers please come forward? In the name and in the spirit of Jesus, we bring our gifts to you, O God. Help us to give them a ready mind, a willing spirit, and a joyful heart. Amen. O God, our beginning and end, by whose command time runs its course. Bless our impatience, perfect our faith, and while we await the fulfillment of your promises, grant us hope in your word. Amen. The first lesson is from Jeremiah 33, verses 14 through 16. It can be found on page 738 in your pew Bible. The righteous branch in the covenant with David. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The word of the Lord.
our second lesson this morning comes to us from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians in the third chapter. Hear the word of God. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. And may he so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. The word of the Lord. Last week, I took some time off for Thanksgiving, but I was really more focused on Christmas. So I spent much of that week cleaning and organizing our home moving boxes of toys to the garage, unpacking Christmas decorations and trying to find space for all of these new things on the side tables and the countertops, anywhere I could, these spaces that have another use for those other 11 months during the year. For me, this whole process can be tiring and it can be stressful. And I just wanted to get it over with. But I also wanted to surround our family with the daily reminders of this season. And I especially wanted to do this for our two-year-old son, Liam. And to see the reactions of awe and wonder which would dance across his face. In that sense, it's all been worth it and then some. On Friday morning of this week, Liam awoke and he came running down the hallway and into the living room to greet me. Well, I thought that he was coming to greet me. He was full of excitement and I did my best to match his enthusiasm. Good morning, Liam, I said as I stooped down to his level and reached my hands out and hoped that he might run straight into my arms. But my son had other things on his mind. He ran in another direction, straight toward the Christmas tree, as quickly as his little legs would allow him. And then he slid to a halt, just a few inches, perhaps, before those branches. His head spun around, his index finger motioned impatiently at the tree in front of him. There was a problem. Yes, The branches had decorations, they had ornaments, they had even streams of light, which were rotating and swirling and spiraling all the way to the top of that tree, and yet they weren't plugged in yet that morning. (laughs) Clearly, something was missing, and he knew it. Turn it on, he squealed. (laughs) So I walked around to the back of the tree and plugged it in creating in an instant a scene of wonder with hundreds of lights passing through the clear glass ornaments at the top, just out of reach, of course, or reflecting from the contours of the metal reindeer, drummer boys, and snowflakes below. With all of these decorations, it was easy to forget that each object was held carefully in place by the steady hand of a deep green branch. And yet it is this, the the deep green branch, that steady and pure focus at the center of it all that I want to spend some time speaking about this morning. You see, our first lesson comes to us from the prophet Jeremiah, a prophet who writes these words. We heard them just a moment ago when Jenny Sue read this passage to us. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will rise up for David a righteous branch, and he 
shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. Here at St. James, we've tried to capture that image this morning. If you just turn to the front cover of your bulletin, you can see how we've tried to capture that thought, that image. We've done that with the picture of a stump and a green spring coming forth from within it. It is an allusion, of course, to the branch of life, to this passage from Jeremiah and the title of my sermon this morning, this first Sunday in Advent. And though, as I said in the children's sermon, that branch is not yet here with us, I still cannot help but recall a conversation that occurred years later at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. It was a conversation between Nathaniel, one of the very first disciples, and another man named Philip, a man who Nathaniel was trying to convince to follow Jesus. Here's how that conversation went. We have found him, says Nathaniel the one about whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus, the son of Joseph, from Nazareth. And yet we can clearly see that in that moment, in that first conversation about who Jesus was and what he meant for the world, that Philip was skeptical. You may remember this response that he offered. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Do you remember that line? Can anything good come out of Nazareth, says Philip? Friends, this is a question, I think, which doesn't just highlight the difference between an optimist and a pessimist. This isn't the only part of this conversation between Nathaniel and Philip. No, I think that this question that Philip offers gets to the very heart of of the question that plagues each and every one of us, each person who claims to call themselves a disciple of Jesus Christ. And the question is this, can God be in the business of doing something new? Can God be in the business of making life flow abundantly, even from those places that we have long forgotten or ignored? or discredited, whether those places are among our neighbors, among people of other countries or nationalities, whether those doubts, those lingering questions remain within our very selves as we approach this Christmas season, can God do something new? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? In other words, can a righteous branch spring up from a stump? And all that Nathaniel has in mind for a response is this. Come and see. Come and see for yourself. Come and witness all that I have seen in the presence of this one. The life of one who shines in the darkness. Surely this is the one for whom we have been waiting. Here it may seem a little abrupt, but I want to shift gears for a moment and tell you about another story. It comes from an article written by Brian Blount. Brian Blount, while I was a seminary student at Princeton, was serving as a New Testament professor there. And then, not long after that, as I made transitions of my own, so did he. And he became the president, the actually the first African-American seminary president of any of the ten PCUSA seminaries in this country. And he now serves still as the president of Union Presbyterian Seminary in Richmond, Virginia. Blount writes that in June of 2009, when we found ourselves in the midst of of the financial crisis that was gripping not only America, but the globe as well. That he was struggling, as many academic institutions were, shaken by all of the disruptions in the financial sectors. 
And in his relatively new administrative post, Blount was worried. He was even confessing in this article that in his weaker moments, he was praying for a sign, even just a little sign, that he would know that his community was walking in the path that God had set before them. Well, one day, Blount entered his office and he went and sat behind his computer and he found this note sitting there that his assistant had left for him. And it seemed that while he was out, the president had a visitor. This visitor was a five-year-old girl named Vismitha Tanetti. Both of the girl's parents were students at Union Presbyterian Seminary. And earlier that day, she had come to the president's office to hand deliver this note that she had crafted along with the help of her parents. You see, a day earlier, Blount had been addressing the seminary community, and he was addressing this financial crisis head on, and he was trying to give everyone in that community a sense of the actions and the steps that the seminary was taking, and they could hear from him personally what kinds of things they were anticipating and what they were hoping to do in the midst of all of this fallout. It was an occasion for this kind of personal talk, right? This way of touching hearts and minds in that seminary community. He was surprised, not not perhaps that Vismitha had attended this. Of course, both of her parents were students, and so where else would she be, right? Of course, she was with them, but he knew that a lot of people that age try to distract themselves during adult conversations like these. And he was amazed that she wasn't playing with toys, she wasn't doodling or scribbling, she was engaged, she was listening, she was paying attention. And that night when she returned with her parents to their seminary student housing, she told them that she too wanted to help the seminary. So she asked them if they could break into her piggy bank, and after getting her permission, her parents' permission to do this, she did, and she eventually counted out enough change for a gift of $52. That's a lot of change, isn't it? This Mitha's father didn't want to leave $52 in pennies and nickels, dimes and quarters on the president's desk. So he wrote a check instead, and they wrote this note that would accompany it, and together they went and hand-delivered this note and the check to the president. To Brian Blount, this check was a sign of God at work. At least in my mind, he wrote. And so for after sitting for almost 10 minutes and just kind of staring into that space beyond his desk, thinking about what a holy moment this all had been, the president composed himself and he wrote a letter of thanks to this five-year-old girl, Vismitha. And next, he thanked God for forgiving him, for asking for a sign in the first place. And finally, he thanked God for offering a sign in the first place. When I first read this story, I thought that I might use it on a stewardship Sunday to come. On some day when I wanted to inspire us all to dig deep, to imagine a new challenge before us, perhaps even when we go to that passage in the lectionary where we find the widow who gave all that she had and was praised by Jesus. These are the sort of inspiring stories that we turn to in the midst of financial concerns and worries. And yet, I've chosen to use it today on the first day of Advent for a different reason. Because I think it fits so well with the questions before us today. Namely, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Or perhaps another question which is like it, for what are we truly waiting for? Have we come to this place at at the end of a, a calendar year, but the beginning of this new Christian year? 
Have we come to this point still with our, our worldly calendar intact? Have we come waiting to see the final numbers on the year that has just passed us by? Are we looking for a sign of success in this place? A count of the number of heads in the pews? A look, perhaps, at how the budget has stacked up as we get to the end of December and we take note of everything that has happened in this place. Is that what we're really waiting for? Some sign of God's favor? A sign of success or failure, perhaps? Perhaps we all face these temptations, if not at this time in the year, at some point when we look around and we want to know that we're a part of something that God, too, believes in. But I think it's especially true that we can begin to have these temptations creep in at a time of extended waiting. Because as I mentioned during the children's message, waiting makes us nervous. Waiting makes us anxious. And that's often the time when we go to the books, we do just like I did last week, we try to get our house in order and make sure that all is pleasing in God's sight. And yet it seems to me that the only sure sign that God is willing to leave any of us is this. It is that sign of a righteous branch, a new beginning. The sign that God is with us. So I think again of Friday morning that I mentioned earlier in the sermon where my son ran down the hallway and slid to just a few inches in front of the Christmas tree. And I plugged those lights in and his face was dazzled. He, he smiled widely and looked at those branches with a look of pure admiration. And he uttered these words. Here we go. <laughs> His words, I think, were far more profound than he could ever know. Indeed, here we go. May it be so. And thanks be to God. Amen. Let us stand and sing together.
seated. In our prayers this morning, we remember Carla Schaefer, who is over-worshiping this morning and leading the Everson Fellowship in worship, and we give thanks that she's able to do this and use her gifts and skills in this way. We also have a prayer here of thanks for, well, from Cheryl McGregor for my mother, Dorothy Wayne Scott's 86th birthday yesterday, praising for her continued good health. And finally, from Sally Albers, asking for prayers for her son, Jeff, who fell off a ladder at his work site and broke his ankle. May he recover quickly and completely. Uh, Of course, we all echo that sentiment. Please join me as we prepare ourselves to celebrate communion. Come to this table. You who have much faith, And you who would like to have more. You who have been to this sacrament often and you who have not been in a long time. You who have tried to follow Jesus and you who have failed. Come, it is Christ who invites us to meet him here. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right for us to give thanks and praise. Loving God, you made this world for us to enjoy. You gave Jesus to be our Savior and friend and to bring us to you. You sent your Spirit to make us one family in Christ. For these gifts of your love, we thank you. We join with angels and saints in this joyful hymn of praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Father of mercy and God of all comfort, we acknowledge you to be the Lord. And at all times, we honor your greatness and glory. First, because you created us in your image and likeness, but chiefly because you freed us from the enslavement of sin through your only Son. You gave him in love to be made man, like us in all things except sin, that by his death and resurrection he might bring again life to all the world. Lord, we admit that we are not able to understand the breadth and length, the height and depth of your love. But true to the commandment of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we come to this table, which he has left for us. We do this knowing that it is meant to be used in remembrance of his death until he comes again in glory. It is here that we declare and witness before the world that by him alone we have received liberty and life. By him alone you claim us as children and heirs. By him alone we have access to your favor, freely shown. By him alone we are raised into your spiritual kingdom there to eat and drink with you and the Son at that most joyful table of eternal life. In this present time on earth, have communion with you in heaven. But in the time to come, we shall be raised to that endless joy prepared for us before the foundation of the world was laid. We acknowledge that we have received these good gifts by your free mercy and grace through your only Son, Jesus Christ. And moved by your Holy Spirit, we as your congregation give you all thanks, praise, and glory now and forever. So send your Holy Spirit on us and on these your gifts of bread and wine that we may know Christ's presence 
real and true. And be his faithful followers, showing your love for the world. Please join me. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, forever. Amen. And please join me in offering the words of the Lord's Prayer as printed in our bulletin. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, the Lord Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it, saying, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant which is sealed in my blood. As often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Friends, these are the gifts of God for all the people of God. Please come. It is the custom of this worshiping community that those seated in the back of the congregation come forward first to receive this sacrament. I invite the communion servers to come forward. And I invite you as soon as they have come forward and the elements are ready to please come forward and join us. All of the bread is gluten-free and everything that is in the cup is juice, no wine. Please come.
Please join me in our prayer following communion. We bless you, O God, for gifts of bread and cup, for sustaining us in hope every day of our lives. We pray for your strength to prepare us now for your service as we offer to you lives of witness and worship in the world you have made. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And please stand for the singing of our closing hymn. Isaiah says, The root of Jesse shall come, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, let us strive to serve Christ in our daily and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come. Lord Jesus, the peace of Christ be with you. Let us offer signs of God's peace. 